so the reason I know her is because Iggy produced a song for her. He produced a song for Tate McRae. And when I've checked her out, it was like, she's a TikTok star. Yeah. Um, Jake Paul has music, mm-hmm. right? Like the, every, the Les Twins who are like break dancers have music. So it's not really so much that like musicians should become entertainers. It's that like entertainers are becoming musicians. Right. So what are you going to do? Are you just going to let them eat your pie (laughs) and you don't try to eat theirs? You know, like (laughs) that's what's happening. The top 40 is like a lot of them aren't musicians originally. That's not what they're known for originally. Right. You are now listening to the Creative Juice podcast brought to you by Indopreneur.io. What's up, Indies? Welcome back to the Creative Juice Podcast. I am your co-host, Jack, and I am flying solo today, but not really. Don't be worried. I'm super, super excited to bring Indopreneur CEO Kyle Circa Lemaire back onto the podcast and welcome, Cirque. It's been a minute. I'm super excited to have you and chat about some really cool stuff today. Welcome back. Yeah, man. It's been a while. Don't call me CEO. I'm just a team player. <laughs> yes. And that's it, dude. I'm super glad to be back. It's It's been a hot minute and I've missed these hollowed halls, dude. Yeah, I'm pumped to have you back, man. When you, uh, for, our, for our listeners, Cirque had reached out to me a couple weeks ago and said, hey, man, I would love to come back on the podcast and talk about just, you know, retouch on some trends that we've definitely touched on before on the podcast and kind of talk about the role of artists in the world and culture and society and also sort of share some of the things that you've been working on in your own artist project and how they kind of all tie in together. So I was super intrigued to uh, one, kind of get some ground level knowledge on what you're working on and also just, you know, touch on some of the trends that we always tend to come back to here um, on the podcast and at Entrepreneur as a whole. Yeah, for sure. I think like when, you know, when, when Entrepreneur started in earnest, it was, the environment was a lot different than it is today. And certainly, you know, my, my thinking has changed, not necessarily like, you know, my opinions are that much different than they were before, but certainly have evolved. And yeah, I, I think that it's a good, as good a time as any to come and sort of like check out where we're at in terms of like the social artist landscape and then also you know talk about what the implications of that are for what artists can do to like make an impact and i think you know i'm definitely speaking from a place of experience here back when i was on the podcast you know as a as a co-host and as a host i hadn't really been releasing records you know i I, i've always been a musician since i'm 12 years old but i hadn't been making studio music since i was like 23 and at the time right you know so like it's definitely been a minute now i'm you know two releases deep with a third kind of on the way uh might already be out by the time this publishes and and in the backlog we have like 14 finished mixes and we've been posting content to instagram like long form short form lots of content to instagram almost every day for the past I want to say two, two and a half months. Um, And so that's definitely given me some perspective in terms of, you know, a lot of the things that artists ask us about, which is like Instagram and followers and like sort of more clout based things. Um, Right. Because that's kind of the space, oddly enough, that I'm operating in now, except, you know, with, with a digital marketing slant on it. Yeah, for sure. So, you know, that's really interesting. It it kind of brings to mind, um, Two things here. One in particular, like a way, way back, um, one of the things that you had talked about, I think probably the last time or the time before that that you were on the podcast was talking about, you know, going deep into your own artistry and how you were going to be hanging out sort of in the introduction and education stages of the buddy system or, you know, discovery and engagement and how that was going to be like a prime focus of yours for. That's what we talked about last time I was on the podcast. I think it might have been one of one of the last times that you were on the podcast. That's wild, dude. Wow. What a yeah. what a time capsule. <laughs> yeah. Super 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 cool. Yeah. Um, so that so it's a nice little recap and I think a perfect time to do it. And you know, you said it well, like not only has not only has things so much changed uh, as far as like, you know, the cultural landscape for artists since, you know, the inception of Entrepreneur and and when you were really 
even heavily releasing music um, earlier on, but also just within the past year and a half, the landscape has changed drastically and been shaken up by, you know, everything going on in the world. Um, so this is such a, I think this is a perfect time to kind of open up the, uh, one, open up the time capsule and also hopefully throw us forward into the future here. So I'm, I'm super pumped. Where do you want to get started? I mean, I think a refresher on what you've been up to with your artist project would be really, really cool. For sure. So yeah, so at the beginning of the year at Entrepreneur, we started this new sort of like workshop group, like a, like a, a focus like group with, with myself, a couple of other team members from Entrepreneur, and then like a hundred indie, you know, indies from our community. Um, we did a Black Friday like special last year. So basically they got like our Indie Pro annual membership, but then they just got this workshop on top of it for Black Friday. Right. And yeah. and so what that was was like to teach Indies the exact workflow processes that we use at Entrepreneur and that like certainly I've learned a lot about over the last year. And so, you know, I made myself sort of a case study for that workshop where it was like, guys, I'm going to be doing this with you. I'm in the exact same position a lot of you are in and let's do it together. And I can show like that way I have a perspective where I can show you, you know, what it's like and, and that it is possible. And so, you know, January 1st, like I, I and Scrum is like the workflow that we kind of taught workflow, you know, Scrum for artists, you might say. And yeah, yeah. I started running Scrum for Artists, quote unquote, January 1st of this year. And and the goal, my, my first big goal, which is part of Scrum, is like setting a longer term goal, was to get to a place where we're, you know, producing a finished, mixed, mastered new song every two weeks. In addition to that, producing an advertisable video for a song every two weeks, doing campaigns releases and then also having like kind of some content and some photos and stuff and that really came to a head in february because we had finished the song part we were getting a finished mix every two weeks and and it wasn't even really that hard we had time left over but when it came time to start creating an albeit ambitious first goal for what content was going to look like i quickly realized like pre-proing setting up lights shooting all this stuff by myself and and needing external cam ops and all that like it's not really feasible and so i dialed it back and and really just kind of a stroke of luck happened where one day you know we were in a session so i kind of need to give a little bit more context i don't want to get lost in the weeds but basically we <laughs> through this whole process like my project has become a music company that's part owned by the people who collaborate on these songs ownership doesn't have any financial gain it's just for voting and then like certainly on every song every person who contributed is like a part owner in that song is like a tiny little company and i yep. i just say that to say that like we monday wednesday friday from two to seven and thank god for entrepreneurs flexible work schedule that i t take advantage of by kind of rearranging my, <laughs> my shout hours. out yeah shout outs um so like Monday, Wednesday, Friday, we have sessions. It started off with just Mondays and it went to Monday, Wednesdays and recently Monday, Wednesday, Friday. And, you know, it doesn't happen every single week. There are many weeks, like rarely do we actually hit all three days of a week, but it's a good chance for me and my collaborators to get together and make music. And so that guarantees the song cycle part of that goal. But then it was like one session I was hanging out and you know, my, the two collaborators I collaborate with most frequently, actually the three I collaborate with most frequently are insane producers. They're like very good producers, f like in, in all different contexts of that word, like, you know, beat maker, sure, but record producer as well, multi-instrumentalist right. as well. So it's like intimidating because I can produce pa powerhouse. Yeah. Yeah. But it's like, I'm not like these guys and, and it's just insane watching them work. So they were heavy into a production session. And I was like, what can I contribute to this? We're not doing lyrics for this. Like, what can I do? I don't want to just get buried in my computer doing like admin. So I pulled out a camera and I just started shooting it. And I do that from time to time, but like I shot this whole session. And then the next day I got curious, like in the morning before work, and I just like threw the footage into Premiere Pro and just started looking at it because I thought it might look cool. And then within an hour, I cut together like two little one minute videos with this like cool little typography style and different film conversions and just like cool little stuff that I like was using in other projects at the time that I just threw in. 
And then I put it out on Instagram as like a little carousel of like an episode. And that's still on our Instagram. You can see it at, at some kid punk, but it's like we'll link to that. We'll link to your IG in the show notes for so sure. And check please it out. don't follow what you're doing. You know, if you if the music's not your cup of tea, please don't follow me and don't like listen to the music on Spotify. You can kind of tell from the Instagram posts like different ranges of the genres we do, but just to not clog up the data, like please, you know, avoid following if it's not stuff that you're interested <laughs> in. For for sure. Um, yeah. So yeah, that said, like I put it out and it did really well. And at that moment, I kind of realized like, wait, I don't have to do a music video and a performance video and a fan finder for like every song and worry about all this stuff. I can just film every session. I, you know, I've got access to two cameras and, and then we have like tons of little cameras. I have a doorbell camera that we, that have, as has been used in the episodes, yeah. you know, yeah. so like any camera that, you know, will do, I've used like tons of different little webcams and stuff. And so it's like, okay, set these up. Let's get footage of all the sessions. And then the next day, it takes me an hour to cut together these little dailies, which is what we ended up calling them. And then that's our content. That's our content, not just for when, you know, we need content every day to feed the beast, but it's also content like when a song's coming out, I can go back and I have archived footage of every song and every sound that goes into that song. I have the video of when it was like when it happened. So it was like total luck that 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 all worked out in that way. Yeah. And then and then I just like I wasn't ready yet to start introduction marketing in earnest like to actually get into business manager and start creating test campaigns and stuff but i was curious and bored so i just threw like a little 150 dollar <laughs> budget on, on one of those dailies yeah and it was nuts <laughs> like i just did it for i made myself a quick audience like an interest-based audience pretty broad with some location limiting to try to like hey if this this is going to be a repeatable thing. I'll just build up in these markets that I, that I personally think are valuable for me. And, and I just did some interest based targeting. That's it. And in Instagram, didn't even go into business manager and, and it went nuts. Like just for like getting profile visits. Cause I'm trying to build up a retargetable audience and getting followers is definitely a way to do that on Instagram. Um, and so I just went for profile visits, which doesn't even really speak to the idea that you're going to get a whole lot of followers. But sure enough, we were getting followers for like, you know, anywhere from fit, like 25 cents up to a dollar. Um, and that was insane. Like, I, it kind of opened my eyes to like, yeah. you know, typically I haven't thought about behind the scenes content outside the context of like YouTube. Like, If you're going to have a YouTube channel as an artist, sure, like you should have like Kenny Beats, like the cave. You should have like an episodic thing. Probably it's yeah. a great form. John, John Bellion's John Bellion, long form dude. studio videos. Yeah. Yes, exactly. So like that makes perfect sense, but I never thought of it as an acquisition asset as something you get new attention with, but right. And it might be that it's short form. It's on Instagram. So it's, it's action packed, right? Cause you can't fit like a whole day into a minute without it being pretty exciting. Unless like the day is just really boring. Um, yeah. Yeah. So, Maybe that speaks to it, but either way, it became a thing. And it is a thing. We we went from, I think, like 1,180 followers last month at some point, or maybe even like the end of May. And now we're at, we're at like 2,060, and it's continuing to climb. The rate is climbing as well. And and then we started releasing our, the songs on Spotify um, about four weeks ago or three weeks ago. And we're going to be releasing every two weeks. And so that's kind of the pre that's like the prefix. That's like the answer to like what has happened since the last episode. It's also the answer to like, you know, what's the context we need to know for this episode. <laughs> for sure. For yeah. sure. Yeah. So, I mean, like zoomed out 30,000 foot view, basically the place that you found yourself in was I'm making music. I'm collaborating with people in this project together, you know, working as a unit, we're working, you know, diligently planning tasks together and making them happen in, you know, in increments and you're putting out content very, you know, somewhat candid content of those sessions. Yeah. It's behind the scenes type stuff and using that as an introduction kind of vessel. 
Yeah, I mean, this definitely isn't meant to be like a tutorial on how to do precisely what I did, but I will say that like, sure. there's yeah. so much value in having a reliable, recurring like session, a standing session that's going to happen. Not only does it make you create a lot more music and be really like disciplined about that, but it creates opportunities for lots of content. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's, that's so interesting, you know, like something we've talked about on the podcast plenty of times when it comes to like building up a backlog of content, whether it be something that's going to go into like a gated experience or to go along with a record release or something like that. We've always kind of sort of softly preached the idea of like make it as you go rather than trying to catch up. And, you know, you're kind of taking that ethos on <laughs> straight to the chest. Yeah, really. Um, and just using it for a different purpose. You're not backlogging it for later. Or, I mean, it certainly could be used for later for other things, but it's living, you know, for a, a content piece that you're putting out there and finding a lot of success with. It's, it's yeah, so there's a couple of different interesting points there. Is, is like One is, like, the model we're following is very much like Russ, Toby Nwigwe, you know, like these yeah, artists yep. who have made really big impacts just by having a consistency to what they're doing like a reliability, like a schedule. You can show up, you can tune in because you know what they're doing. And it's 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 like information that's just in your mind. Like if you don't know who Toby Nwigwe is, you know, go check him out. He's amazing. Him and his wife and his all their friends are just like the most creative people you'll ever see. And yeah. they've become huge. And it's just off the strength of consistency and like a format. And, you know, it's it's just it's just remarkable that like I can just tell you oh yeah Toby Nwigwe has got a new song coming out uh, next week because I know that that's the case you know what I right. mean right and yeah and for Russ for the longest time it was the same thing and I think that like I definitely got starry eyes when I saw it confirmed with Toby Nwigwe and I was like I need to that's probably what I want to do I want to I want to release me start releasing music and never stop because it's like. This, I don't do well with like things I can't make a routine, you know? <laughs> sure. Yeah, 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 totally. I, I mean, I feel you on that quite a bit. It's hard to fit. It's hard to fit things into a busy day as a, as a creative, if you don't plan it into your routine, you know, like right. ad hoc, random things, chaos thrown into the mix of your week or your two weeks or your month or whatever tend to not produce, you know, at least for, for people like you and people like me tend to not produce like favorable outcomes. Yeah. Yeah. It, it doesn't work out. And, and not only that, but it's like, it's not that it doesn't work out because of like some mysticism about routines or anything or some like fluff that I could give you about having a routine. It's just, it's just <laughs> that, it's just that um, a routine is just a commitment. It is a commitment of time that you've made standing. So you're just like non-negotiable. This is what's happening. It's like a, it's like a commitment that just, lives on perpetually and so right. it's the commitment that you're making it's that you're committed that is the thing you know <laughs> totally yeah. yeah yeah that's exactly it yeah but yeah man so that that sort of like set off the journey since then i've come to this sort of or i'm coming to some conclusions and realizations that like first of all i'm not the only one who's doing what we're doing I know that. I know that there's lots, there's a high preponderance of behind the scenes and in studio and like during the creation of content out there and has been for a while. Like Aries, sure. we share Aries. I showed you Aries a while back. Yeah, He's I, lo I love Aries. Yeah, so good. He did the same thing. The reason John Bellion got so huge, in my opinion, is the videos like that. And dude, yeah, I say I say all the time. I discovered John Bellion not from his music initially. From I, it was from his videos. Content. Like that was that was my first exposure to him as an artist. Was these videos, and I was like, "Damn, dude, this guy is so good!" Like I'm I'm entertained to the point where I'm sucked in, and I'm watching this you know 15 minute studio video. Yeah, I'm like I'm I'm biting into it hard, you know. So when I do when I did go eventually listen to his music, probably shortly after that video, uh, I was in, you know, I was I was there. <laughs> it pretty much converted me to a fan. Yeah, dude. Yeah. And I think that that's like such a major part of it. Right. Like it. It's like good music has always been sort of the centerpiece, right? Like great music that's going to impress people. 
The only X factor has always been how are you going to get them to hear it so that they can be impressed? Yeah, and how are you yeah. going to be so compelling in that interaction that it happens again and again? How are you going to ensure it happens again and again? That's really like the... Yeah, predi- predictably, consistently. We just reduce marketing down to a simple line of code. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Right? Yeah. In terms of music marketing, like that's your central challenge. If you don't have good music, yeah. like obviously that's a huge, huger problem. That's, pre- right. that's prereq. Once you're there, I've found that I found that this not only impacts how you're going to get an audience, but how you're going to monetize that audience as well. Because certainly like in the age of streaming, you know, everyone in the music industry has themselves fooled that like, oh, this is a viable business again. You know, like this is a really powerhouse industry again, thanks to streaming. And it's like, yeah, you guys are getting million dollar checks again, but but that doesn't mean that your industry still isn't playing around in the sandbox, you know? Right. Yeah. And so I think that there's like, there's a lot of artists out there who may not realize that they, that they know it, like what I've just said, but they're, they're certainly acting like they know it. They're acting like they know that like streaming is playing around in the sandbox and the real money and the real attention and the real growth and the real actual like impact is in world building world yeah. building and you nerds out yeah. there will know what i'm talking about when i say world building mm, but yeah we've definitely we've touched on this a little bit too even recently in the podcast just talking about you know live streaming yeah. and uh and some of the work that artists have done you know throughout like quarantine and and coronavirus and whatnot with building really compelling not only compelling like technologically and visually, but also, you know, from a narrative perspective, building live stream events and experiences for their fans that really feel like they're, you know, world building. Yeah. Yeah. It's sort of like, you know, who does world building really, really well is Ja. Yeah. Big Ja. Big Ja. Yeah. He's amazing. So he's like a YouTuber. Check him out. He's amazing. And He's like got all these catchphrases. He's got all these characters. He's got all these things that Mm -hmm. are going to reoccur. And part of making someone familiar with your brand and what you're putting out is that is that reliability is take the most energetic moments and don't ever let them happen once. It can't be just once. Everything is a series. Everything has the potential to be a new, a new catchphrase, a new inside joke, a a t-shirt. I'll give you an example. We, through our ads, we had a particular ad, like one of the dailies has just done really, really well. And I think it's because the song that's featured in it, it's a series of dailies, right? So I know it's the song because it's only the dailies that have this song in it. And they just do exceptionally well in terms of like boosting those posts. And a gentleman came in off that, like a fan of ours, I guess. And he commented in the comments, OP1 Kenobi, because Iggy plays the OP1 synthesizer primarily while he's producing. And he called Iggy OP1 Kenobi. And then it happened again weeks later and someone, someone else who he knew that I don't know was like he's like like certified it he was like yeah he definitely is op1 kenobi their friends they're talking about it in their worlds and now it's in our world and so the what i'm doing is i hit up our designer friend casey and i was like i'm gonna send you a bunch of photos i need you to make like a mixtape style rap tee for op1 kenobi that will be our first merchandise not only because it's like fun that we just sp- we can just spin it off of like a comment on Instagram and that he'll certainly be geeked out that fan, but also because it's like the energy's there and why not? And like now we're creating a tangible world, like an inside joke, references that fans can share. I think that really is the opportunity that you have in BTS. I don't think John Bellion did that a whole lot. And I think that was like the one leg missing from his tripod. Great music. Yeah. Yeah. Great music. And then like a, an abnormal or like a greater than average view into the creation of that music. And then as if it's like something that you're supposed to see, like Kenny beats the cave on YouTube, 
but it's just yeah. missing that world. I don't know what John Billion's world is. I know a little bit about his production world from that documentary and like all his friends he came up with in music. I know a little bit about it. I saw it on stage when I saw him live because I saw those people reoccur, but there's no culture to it that I can grab right. onto. So yeah. Right. I, it doesn't make you it doesn't make you a part of it. Right. I don't have like unique bellyonish things, you know, except for like production ideas are a bellyonish or less bellyonish. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. That's a really interesting that's a really interesting point. Just about uh, and I mean it, it kind of goes back to what you said about like, you know, the future monetization in the music industry doesn't lie in streaming. That's like child's play <laughs> right. when compared to when compared to world building. And, you know, I think you explain world building really well by relating that, you know, that really simple story of OP1 Kenobi. And this could be, you know, your first piece of merch. And there's fans who know about it and they continue to tell each other about it or talk about it without you guys even being there. Right. And I think where you often see this play out, and I see it in a lot of like comment sections, for example, um, for for a number of our clients at the at IndieX, for example, um, you know, particularly on videos that are being well received or content that's being well received and getting a lot of engagement, you'll see fans interacting with one another around things like catchphrases or inside jokes or just stuff that they pick up and or make make up themselves, and then all of a sudden it becomes like a you know, an idea or a reality. Um, I see that happen all the time. Yeah, man. It's, uh, it's like, I, I think like one of my favorite examples in music marketing is like those who are longtime listeners of this podcast will know, like, look at insane clown posse, look at the misfits, right? Like these are world builders, certainly insane clown posse. It, you know, for those of you who are not familiar, like all of their fans participate in some kind of like religious, you know, origin story about like yeah. carnivals and shit and it's like okay that's a world that all of their fans live in all of the associated artists on their label also exists in that world every piece of merchandise exists in that world and it's a merchandise empire the likes of which like certainly like even major label top 40 artists aren't don't know anything about and yeah, it's, it's wild to see that it, and this is not like a purely capitalist thing like I don't want you to get that impression. The The realization of this thing's, I guess, economic potential, this idea's economic potential is is after the fact, right? Pri right primary right. is like, oh man, we need to create so much content. And like, oh, we have this cool, okay. And like, oh, I can slap this on it. Okay, put it out. And like, people like it. And it's like, let's do more. Let's do them every session. And then like, oh, people want, to participate in the inside jokes we're creating in that content. Okay, let's give them ways to participate. Um, right. Building a, it's, it's brand building, right? Like I, I'm I say world yeah. building, but like, this is a lot of what an entertainment brand is. It's what YouTube stars are about. Like Peter McKinnon certainly built a world in which like he wakes up every day, he makes coffee from scratch. And then he like, you know, uses Canon cameras to photograph and film things all day in Canada. And that's his life. And he's an outdoor guy and he is extreme, you know, this or that. And he loves making things with leather. And like, I know all these things because I watched his vlog. Right. You yeah. know, like that's a crazy amount of of experience to pack into like episodic viewership, I would say. <laughs> yeah, for sure. And, you know, you you bring up a really good point, like the the youtuber kind of space even like vloggers vloggers in particular i think lean into this somewhat naturally um because of the fact that like you know if you're doing a you know maybe like a daily vlog or a weekly vlog and going into your life and what you're doing with your friends um, and whatever else it is that you're interested in naturally like for one, inside jokes are going to come up along the way and open loops are going to happen naturally, you know? So people are looking to the next thing yes. that you're doing and looking and looking for the treasure that you left behind in the last video there again. You know, it's like uh, it's like if you, I don't know, like something silly like, oh, you know, last week I was watching my friend's dog and it was staying at my house and, you know, that was in my video. The dog was in my video and like wandered into a room. If that happens again the next in the next episode, it automatically becomes something that clicks to people and they say, oh, well, I remember that from the last time. Like, it's becoming a recurring theme. Fans look for that. 
um, often, yeah, <laughs> very often. I know I find myself doing it all the time for the artists that I like. You look for kind of, it's either it's, it sometimes starts out like Easter eggs, you know, um, unintentionally, maybe from the creative side, but it could start out like Easter eggs and then becomes like a realized thing that fans kind of latch onto and make their own. Yeah. And, and it's also something that like, you know, I, I remember, how do I say this? There are cultural modes of being, which I no longer participate in, but I remember everything. I remember all the little catchphrases. I remember all the little like verbs and things you can do and should do in that culture. You know what I mean? Right. That right. stuff yeah. stays with you and it lives forever. And so, you know, music does too. This just happens to complement that in such a way that can draw attention to the music. And certainly that's what it's done for us because people listen to our records and we're getting sentiment back where it's like, I feel like I know you guys because I spend like, you know, two minutes every day with you guys or three minutes every day. And yeah, that's that's such a powerful point to make. Yeah, man. Like, that's it. Like, and I get on my high horse and like get on the pulpit here often about like live streaming and stuff like that and how like. At the core of it, it's getting your people, your tribe to take that, to carve out that five minutes, that two minutes, whatever it is out with you. And that's why, because at the end of the day, that's what gets them to know you and know that they align with you. Yeah, I'm, I'm kind of, you know, to be honest with you, these days I'm so bearish on live stream performances, but live stream sure. interaction I'm incredibly bullish on, especially if yeah, it's yeah, branded yeah. live stream interaction with a schedule that people know they can show up for. And it is interactive. They ask questions or they, you know, this or that. It's interesting how the pandemic has changed all that. I used to think like live stream performances are tight, but they're so they've lost all of their novel characteristics. <laughs> <laughs> 100%. Yeah. 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 We have, we have, we have beat that horse to death <laughs> yeah. for sure. Um, but yeah, I mean, this is really interesting. Like, I think, you know, movie fandoms are like this where the people who go really deep into, I don't know, pick, pick any, take any, pick any movie take that all the Kevin yeah. Smith movies. Yeah. Yep. You know? Yeah. He literally calls it yeah, the it, view askew universe. Cause his company is view askew like films or something. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. And they're all interrelated yeah. and they all have references to each other in them. And every Pixar movie has a reference to the next Pixar movie in the last one. Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, look, at look, you can look at Star Wars, you can look at Star Trek, you can certainly look at things like the Marvel films and the universe that's been built there, like all of that. Uh, and the fans that hang out in it, like that deep devotion is kind of, I, I think what we're getting at here yeah. <laughs> about like where the future of this thing is going, you know, if, if I can, if I can be so bold to say that. Yeah. I think that like, I, I want to delineate here. Cause like, why make an episode about this? Are you telling all people, all musicians, if they want to be successful, that they have to like put out like behind the scenes, micro content on Instagram every day. Like, no, that's not what I'm saying. Um, what I'm saying is that if what, if you are like me, not not just completely like turned off by the idea of creating content. If that's something that sounds cool to you, that you love doing, you know, and you just want to be able to do it better and easier, okay, then I'm you know I'm talking to the right person. It's like insofar as like you're an artist who wants to use that content to like do what I'm saying, build a world. And I would say like you know iPhones definitely cut it. But having, you know, a, a little camera with some like manageable file sizes that you can edit with and learning to edit. You know, a year ago, I was saying that this was like kind of a, a necessary skill for wanting to guarantee your ability to like self-promote on the Internet. Yeah. I would say it is like a requirement these days, like is becoming more and more like you just can't afford to not know this stuff, if, especially if you're an artist and you already learned a DAW or an instrument. It's like learn, yeah, learn I mean, how to do it. <laughs> you know, I think there's, I think part of the reason for that is like audiences or, or users of social media platforms in general, 
they're getting exposure to higher quality content. Like the status of native native content is changing on platforms. So you have to go with that a little bit. You know, you have to go with that tide. Everyone's favorite musician has like fire content. Yeah, almost exactly. You know, like it's like it's that's not a crazy thing to say anymore. It has insane visual yes. content or just really high high quality. Right, exactly, exactly. So I think I think that kind of leans into your point about the necessity and almost the requirement at this point to have to have that skill set either in your arsenal personally or have someone in your circle yeah. who, you know, wants who who digs that and wants to do it and wants to be a part of it. And I I would be I guess I would be, you know, I've gotten a little less afraid to kind of hardline that specifically for the people who for whom that's an interesting prospect because because sure. of my experience in best year ever where it was like i met so many indies who like yeah i just got this a7s3 and i got this lens and i'm like okay let's go you know like they're willing to make the investment yeah. or they're willing to take the plunge and they want to learn and they want to do well it's like okay there are a lot of people out there like that let's go let's do it and yeah you know if forced to use my samsung to make the dailies i could and would but i would say that there's like a difference between i have a different i have a different confidence interval for the person who made an investment and a commitment to do this versus someone who was like oh i can use what i have in my pocket tight let's go right you know? right like that that's a stop gap not the goal right right you know right and it's like i mean I, it, you know if if it is the case that you would do the, all these things with like your iphone you probably would be already right yeah yeah exactly i mean that's exactly it like the the camera is not your problem like you if you're still saying i can do this with my iphone and you haven't been doing it for four years then it's not likely it's, to just miraculously <laughs> yeah it's not the iphone <laughs> you know yeah for sure for sure but yeah so that like that's just to get that out of the way with like the what you need you know i'm i'm not this is instagram you could shoot 720p not hd and you'd be fine so you don't need to go crazy there right the very affordable options in that realm and then and then you know for editing that's really easy too with the dailies just like jack said you know every one of our dailies ends with next heist and this is just an accident next heist the date of the next daily that's going to come out not when it comes out but when it was shot and then till then, which is like a cliffhanger, you know, you said that was um, a, you said that was an accident, an accident in the sense that like that was the first thing I did and we never changed it, man. <laughs> what know? a happy like, almost, accident. Yeah. Almost everything with the dailies is like, oh, I just tried this out one time. And it's like now it's like that. Right. You know, because right. I literally copy the sequence in Premiere Pro and just duplicate it and then just like change the footage. So, so that's if how I did it in the last one. It might, it probably will carry on unless I hated it. So that's how you're talking about creating content in a way that's better for you as an artist and easier for you. You're you one, like, you know, requirement number one, you've got good music requirement. Number two, you're interested in doing that. And then you've just got a system, right? And then you've just got a system for which to do it. It fits into something that's already happening in your music business. Yeah. Now I would say like, not in the vein of what we're talking about, but maybe necessary to it is like, you know, have a have a have a meaningful amount of time in your weekly schedule dedicated to creation. If not, like, what are you going to capture? What are you going to document? Right. You know? Right. Yeah. And every time you need to document it, it's like an emergency you didn't plan for. It's hard to form a habit that way. But that said, like, you know. Like just going back to Jaw, like Jaw puts out videos like every week. Yeah. Multiple. He he doesn't stop. Yeah. That's why he's successful. That's why he has a world for people to immerse themselves in. Yeah, totally. And the man is and a I machine. Think the same is now Yeah, for real. It's insane the amount of content he puts out. And and he's trying to make it better while putting out that volume. And that's what happens when you make that kind of commitment. You would think like, oh, it's just gonna atrophy and get really bad. It's like, no, it won't. It's staring you in the face every day. You're going to get better if you are the type of person who doesn't just like repeatedly fail at things. You're going to you're not going to want it to suck forever. Right. You know? Yeah. Yeah. Iteration happens naturally. Right. Totally. So, you know, these are practical, you know, tips for maybe getting to a level where you're in a place to put out like lots of content. And then once you do like, 
you know, especially if you have your own culture among the people you create with anyways, or your friends, document it. Don't worry about the format. Don't worry about like what you're shooting. Just document, find a recurring way to document and then play around with the footage and posts and see if you can like put out stuff that people enjoy. For me, it's been an exercise in like setting the cultural tone for our first fan base. And you know, it's, it's producer minded culture, people who are heavy into like musicology and making music. Right. People, and people like us. Is, right. And it's like, you know, it's like hip hop culture v- vaguely and, and yeah, it's, 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 I'm starting to realize that we are, we're entertainers in a much more broad sense when we're doing this. And certainly like this musical project is not a musical project. It is audio visual, but it's also potentially physical at one point. And to constrain it to like, we're artists, we're in this band, we make this music is the silliest thing that anyone can do in this day and age. You know, if you're going to do that, like the, the era in which that that was a thing that happened and worked is gone, except for maybe like anything else is an edge case. It proves the rule. Right. You know? Yeah. This is kind of, so, this is starting to lean into, you know, the higher level of what we're talking about. Like you're, what you've been experiencing personally is like the microcosm for what we're sort of seeing as a, a, sh- a continue, a continual shift, something that's been going on for, I think, you know, right. a, a number of years. It's a nice way that we've segued in and out of the different parts of what we want to talk about. Yeah. This is good because yes, exactly. Who are the biggest music stars of 2021? What, what, where do they come from? Do you know? No, maybe, I don't know. TikTok, I guess. Right. TikTok. Yeah. So yeah, like the, the number one music stars, Charlie D'Amelio, like, uh, actually Iggy produced a song for her, right? Charlie, Charlie D'Amelio. That's wild. Yeah. No, Tate. Sorry. Sorry. Not Charlie D'Amelio. Tate McRae. Oh yeah. Yeah. Yep. Right. So the reason I know her is because Iggy produced a song for her. He produced a song for Tate McRae. And when I've checked her out, it was like, she's a TikTok star. Yeah. Um, Jake Paul has music, mm-hmm. right? Like the, every, the less twins who are like break dancers have music. So it's not really so much that like musicians should become entertainers. It's that like entertainers are becoming musicians. Right. So what are you going to do? Are you just going to let them eat your pie (laughs) and you don't try to eat theirs? You know, like (laughs) that's what's happening. The top 40 is like a lot of them aren't musicians originally. That's not what they're known for originally. Right. So it's like the new entertainment is the output, right? But the business is public figure. You're a, you're in the public figure business. Right. And public figures have a culture that people participate in that they align with. And this is all goes back to like the longer term societal trends that like people have been talking about since like, you know, the early 2000s of like we're heading from an individualistic society to a community based society. Right. Right. Um, that these are the communities like that people form around natural leaders who are public figures. What do the public figures do? They produce content for us to consume, which informs us about like how to be in the world. Yeah, totally, man. And I mean, like n- not to get political, but we even saw a decent amount of that in like the past two elections and probably further back than that. Certainly further back than that. Now that I say it out loud, like with, right. you know, for people who think in the old paradigm or an older paradigm, they would say things like, oh, you're a X, Y, Z. You shouldn't talk about ABC. You know, you're a football player. Why are you talking about politics? You're an artist. Why are you talking about the president? That kind of stuff. You would see that. Yeah. You know, people would look back at and, and kind of think in that old paradigm where, you know, that we're moving away from that. And it's like the answer is like, I'll tell you why, because you don't ask political scientists to come on this show. <laughs> You only ask entertainers and sports stars. Right. So that's what you're going to get is political opinions from entertainers and sports stars. Meaning like the only people that they want to broadcast, even on the news, is enigmatic figures. That's what they like. They want like, you know, larger than life people. That's what we all want to like grab onto and gravitate towards. And it's not so much like, how do I say this? It's not like it's not like clicky and limiting because it's like every culture, every type of person 
self selects their representatives. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like totally. I, my my representatives, like even if you're like completely anti establishment, to some degree or another, you select your representatives. And that's why it's like so hard to be a true anarchist, right? Because yeah. like at the end of the day, you're gonna you're gonna create some kind of system inadvertently. So it's like, yeah, like that's what we do. We select leaders. We've done it since the era of kings. And, yeah. and now we do it through a democratic process, presumably. But like that, you know, that can manifest in other forms. And it certainly is in a way we don't really see in the in, in this whole entertainment thing. Yeah, because people order their lives around, you know, the 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 entertainment that they consume, the stuff that makes them, you know, gets them excited or the, the things that get, you know, raise the bumps on the back of their neck. Like you organize your life in some way around, or, or that's, I should say, that's part of the way that you organize your life. You know, it fits into that whole, that whole, you know, piece of who you are. But even furthermore, you actually, you actually do things because of who your heroes are. Yeah. You know, like you really do like so much of your life's decisions are impacted in massive ways by who your heroes are. And like, no bullshits. Some of my heroes growing up, Red Man and Method Man. What is what impact does that have on like my decisions in, you know, in in all forms of life, in relationships, in school, in a work environment? Like, what does that do? Um, who your heroes are has a has a big impact on who you are and, and your morals and your ethics and, and and what you say and who you want to appear to be like and your style. And we all are looking for a source of that that's like palatable to us and it's it, it it comes from within sometimes rarely in rare instances it does come from within but a much greater source is the pantheon and and the most successful operators in that pantheon guess who they are famous entertainers yeah that's why they're famous they're successful at selecting cultural items to adorn ourselves with yeah in our behavior so anyways, I hope that wasn't a weird, crazy rant. No, <laughs> I mean, I think I think it kind of sets the baseline for one, like it sets the psychological baseline for, you know, the topic of this episode, like the shifting state of what it means to be an artist or a creative in the world, because um, this doesn't just apply right. to artists or bands. It could apply to, you know, YouTubers, comedians, you you name it, really documentary videographers, all of it, you know? Yeah. Yeah, and it's also like it, it it sort of unifies things like in my thinking because there's all these different disparate like tips and like things you got to focus on and we're always looking for a way to explain it in such a way where like I can tell you this one sentence and from that you can derive everything else. Yeah. You know, we want that unified field equation for like how to how to succeed in this entertainment field. And for me, you know, this, this is a bit, this is like a huge step in that direction because, because like everything kind of condenses back down to the same thing. Just like I just said, where like, okay, the more successful entertainers are the ones who have like collected the most allegiance in terms of like cultural leadership. And that makes a lot of sense. It explains a lot of things with this. It also explains what standing out means what standing out means is that like when you see the title of one of our videos is it sufficiently different enough that it establishes a baseline for culture meaning like is it is it the is it the sort of like canary in the coal mine that tells our fans to pay attention because that might reappear and it might be a thing right you know it, it, because like Okay, we use an app on my phone called Spacey to italicize and bold some words in our Instagram copy. That happens in every one of our posts. That is something that alerts the mind that what I'm seeing is is different from the rest. It doesn't fit this set. Yeah, yeah. So immediately it gets a form of significance. When that happens again, it sets you apart from the set because now you're participating in it. You've noticed a pattern. You're, you're locked to this pattern. Well, you know, it's, that's such a, that's such an interesting point because, you know, when you're initially doing things like that, it's, you know, whether consciously or unconsciously creating pattern interrupts, not necessarily just in video, but any kind of pattern interrupt, 
uh, interrupting the mode of being that someone is in. But then what you're doing with that as it continues is you're not interrupting the pattern anymore. You're, you know, building it. You're building the pattern for someone that, that sticks in their head. Yeah. You're building a path for them, really. Yeah, it goes from being a sort of like, it goes from being a flare to being a beacon. Yeah, that's so good. It goes from being something that like stands out in the dark to something that like calls you home. Yeah. It tells you, oh, you're in the right place in your feed scroll because here's today's daily. Right. And yeah. It also creates, how do I say this? As a creative, right? It's hard to, it's much easier to, to destroy than it is to build. Meaning, it's much easier to take order and introduce a little bit of chaos than it is to take a sea of chaos and try to make more chaos that's like significant in some way. Right. You know, or yeah. construct order, which is like the hardest of all things. Yeah. And so, you know, you can take, you're creating an ordered set. You're creating an order in your culture, in your culture with your fan base. And when you disrupt it, if you have a lot of people paying attention and they know the program, disrupting it becomes an artistic act. Yeah, that's so good. Yeah, yeah. That's, that's such a good, yeah, that's so good. That's such a good point. You know, it's it's interesting, like we, you hear the word like, and I, I think I even said it earlier in the episode, like you hear the word and it's it's been thrown around forever for years, in, especially in like music marketing circles is like, you got to build a tribe. Like it's become sort of, you know, this, yeah. it's, it's become this trope, but there's really you know, this kind of is what we're talking about. You know, it's building a... It is, but it's it, hopefully it's in a, in a way where, like, because every time I've ever heard that, it's like, okay, cool. Practical, specific steps. N there's none to be found when right. people say that. But I hope what we're talking about here is much more concrete than that, you know? Yeah, for sure. Yeah, I th and I think that's the... I think that's the... that's I think that's been the issue with the idea of, like, building a community or a tribe because it's nebulous, right? Like, it's like, you just got to right. do it. Like, oh, build your tribe, build your tribe with no real... I mean... With no real context behind what that actually means. In lieu of any more specific advice, that advice will do because those who will do it will figure it out. And those who right. don't do it won't figure it out. So it yeah. makes perfect sense. Like, yeah, go and activate and participate in and put out content to a community, you know? Um, like if you actually do it day in and day out, that will work. <laughs> yeah. So it's not terrible advice. It's just not very specific and it's not very motivating. It doesn't give you something to do tomorrow. Right. Not a lot of action items, not definitely right. not step by step. But not inherently bad. <laughs> it's a good. It's a right. good. It's a good kind of uh, you know, North Star to to walk through drunkenly. <laughs> right. But it is. It is. A, a, and and I'm sort of getting a, a. You know, like obviously we're not like the most organic marketing like outlet that you could go to. We're into paid traffic, baby. We like throwing some ducats behind it. Right. But but this does clue me into what that is like and what it's about. Yeah. Know? Yeah. For sure. Um, I'm starting to get it. It's, it's, and like, I don't promote all of the dailies. Some of them do well all on their own. And yeah, it's, uh, it's been very, very interesting. I think that, um, I think that what we're saying, or like, at least what I'm saying here is that like, when it comes to quote unquote, like building your tribe, um, it is true. It is true that like consistent action will do certainly all the coolest things about what we're doing that I've figured out is just trial and error. And, and that's an important point to take away from all this too, is that like, I think the reason that I've been having such a blast and having so many cool wins and having like a really great time doing all this is that I have a lot of at bats. I can be wrong in a day and it's not the end of the world. I can screw something up massively and it does, it's low stakes because guess what? There's going to be another one tomorrow. And this is like an old trope of ours. This is something we've been talking about a long time, but Dan Carlin, the podcast host of Hardcore History says quantity has a quality all on its own. Yeah. And the quality is I get a lot of chances to figure out what the best thing is and learn. You said that to me when you were starting off these dailies a few months ago and you, I, you know, one morning hit me up and you were like, yo, dude, like we started doing this thing. I'm really excited about it. And I, it just gives me a lot of chances to be in front of people. You use the word at bats. And I think that that's, yeah. that's definitely like an important, 
I think an important concept to lock in, lock in on here. And we sort of touched on this on last week's episode too, talking about like, as you get more at bats, you can start to use, you know, the engagement, the reactions, the sort of intangible, uh, picking up of the inside jokes as your feedback for what to continue doing and sort of give you a little bit more objectivity. Um, that was something that I think is important because like you can't, you can't always just throw anything out there. You can start with trial and error, but you have to, you know, let the trial give you meaningful data. Big time, dude. Yes. And, and, and that's another, another vote of confidence for paid traffic is that when you're doing only organic marketing, if I were only doing organic with the dailies, I would have no mechanism by which to tell if a difference in results was purely due to a difference in environment. Not the content, not the audience seeing the content, but the environment in which the content was released, the day, the political yeah, climate. Right. What albums got released that day? Like what TV shows were on? You yeah, know, was current, it rainy? You any know? any current event from smallest thing like the weather to, you know, right. tragedy like an earthquake. Right. Because the dailies are a single point in time in a day, you really cannot discern if something underperformed because the day was weird. Right. If it were something that happens every second, you could, but you don't have enough data points. So yeah. it's just like one jagged spike right. in the data. So, so yeah, it's not a smooth curve. And so that would suck because I wouldn't be able to tell which dailies truly were the, the best performers. I even have data to say that like, yeah, that happened. I, we had a particularly off day, but... I ran ads on it and it was one of the best performers. So, you know, that's what paid traffic is really valuable for. Cause certainly like, like there's three dailies that, that just get us new fans like gangbusters and they're all super like into it and motivated and they comment and they say cool things that mm, those, you know aren't those like cult, bot yeah, comments. Those cultural fit yeah. fans, the ones that you want. Right. Right. So, we have three dailies that just do that like clockwork and none of them happened in the last month. They're older. So it's interesting. You can use paid traffic to suss out like, okay, well, what's different about these now? Now that I have this different result, oh, okay, all these start off with uh, the same, they're all the same song. The, all the same songs being produced in all three of them. Okay, that song's really good. That's going to go on streaming. Not only that, we have this huge warm audience who has been waiting to hear the song. They're going to go right to Spotify when it comes out, and that's going to give us massive signals there. So that's great. But also, on top of all that, I learned all of these daily start off with the song playing uh, studio audio with the production happening before the actual title card. Mm. In the dailies that underperformed, it's a narrative cold start. People are talking. So production and people playing instruments is key to hooking people in that first three seconds of these right. days. Yeah. It needs to be a moving camera. People need to be doing something. And I wouldn't have, I mean, I know that intuitively because of pattern interrupts, but it's not like the camera wasn't moving in the other ones. So I now know kind of a, a rule of thumb for our advertising specifically. Right. You're, you're seeing things through your tests, you know, one through your organic content through to through two through test it with paid traffic and then analyzing your videos and being like, you know, what can we do differently? Where does, you know, where do these kind of shots fit in and allowing yourself to break the molds if necessary of what you already know, you know, just from being a creator and being a marketer. Yeah. And it's also very non-disciplined uh, media buying that I'm doing, right? Like I'm right. using the Instagram ad platform and really my barometer here is to say, what are my costs per followers and comments? I'm not going to go deep into the data. I know that those things don't actually necessarily matter. That said, it's a good barometer at a quick glance to understand how is this performing compared to others. Right. And th and then like this isn't like a multivariate test that I set up in Business Manager. I ran three dailies here, ran three dailies there. Oh, this these aren't these suck. What's going on here? Ran those other three dailies again. Oh two of these are killer, you know, like it's just frustration and trial and error. And it's because of all the at bats and the constant attention that that can have the same impact as a disciplined study. <laughs> you know? Right. Yeah. Yeah, totally. I mean, I think that that kind of fast action is 
and the ability and willingness to like break things as you go and be imperfect and not have to structure, you know, the perfect test in ads manager and stuff like that. I think that's particularly important for artists that are, you know, content driven because, you yeah. know, they might get the content out there, but then get hung up on like the, okay, here's where I put my headlines. Uh, I need to upload the video perfectly like this. Oh shoot. The aspect yeah. ratio is wrong. Oh wait, I selected the wrong placement. You know, all of those things can kind of get in the way of just allowing this to start becoming a part of your process. Yeah, dude. And, and it's really like a lot of what we teach it, it seems to take the presupposition that the content and the music is a scarce resource. So we need to be very careful. We need to measure 10 times before we cut because you've got this one album or you've got this one single or this one video and you need it to go well. And so a lot of our stuff is very cautious because of that. Like that's the common artist situation. Is yeah. that like you've yeah. been planning this huge release. You haven't done anything since the last one. And now it's go time and you need it to go off without a hitch. And so our marketing is pressure built in that way. With this, it's like, I got another daily to edit tonight. Like, it yeah. doesn't really matter how this goes. Right. You know? Yeah. Like, um, but you, again, because it's staring you in the face every day, you want it to go well. So the pressure of having it happen every day and it not going well is enough to like make the right minds fix it and make it better. Yeah, that applied pressure keeps you moving forward and keeps you getting better. For sure. Big time. So yeah, and this again, this is not this is not unique. This is like a trend, you know. Kenny beats the cave. Uh I mean John Bellion to give a more historical example. Um and then certainly on Instagram like and on TikTok like even like TikTok's a little bit more short form even than Instagram somehow, but that said like um it's happening like like a lot of promotional cuts these days are coming out as like in the studio or listening yeah to like finish mixes and i think it denotes that shift of like the lines are getting blurred between social media star tv star athlete uh musician actor comedian like these are not these are not so like separated ideas anymore. Yeah, yeah, they're not exclusive categories that, you know, a creative fits into, you know, they you fit into one and you don't fit into another. Um yeah, and you I think you break into the public conscience conscious and you can do all of them. And I think that's the coolest thing in the world. Like that should be that should be liberating for creatives, you know, not like yeah. just not scary or like grumpy sad like oh why can't we just be art like no go in like there's yeah there i mean certainly the most successful artists are the ones who turn that into an art form that they can play games with yeah totally it's super interesting you mentioned tiktok like i can't remember her name right now but there was an artist that went viral on tiktok i want to say back in the fall of 2020 around like september october and she what she went viral on was like it was a native piece of content for sure. Um, and not like high quality by any means, but it was just her crying to her, the listening to the mix that she had just gotten from her producer in her car, um, and crying to it. That's and it, fire. and it went viral. And, you know, because of that, they were like, Oh shit, we're going to scramble and drop the song, you know, in two days. And that was one of those moments that it was like, people connected with what they were seeing in front of them in that little short form piece of video enough to be like, okay, yeah, we're, we we're bought into this, you know? Oh, and do we have any doubt in our minds that the same would not be true if they only heard the song? No. Right. Like it is purely because of this real moment in this person's life that that song got the traction it got. Totally. Um, is the song good? Sure. That's a necessary prerequisite. But that's not why. <laughs> yeah, exactly. It's really interesting. I'm like super eager to see how this continues develop to develop, especially like, you know, I think it's it's really funny talking about this today, honestly, because I feel like this would be something this probably would have been something that you and I like chatted about off to the side when we met, you know, years yeah, ago. Like sure. we probably would have like had a conversation like this and and been dreamy eyed about it. And I don't think I would have had the, I definitely didn't have the foresight then 
to look at where we are today and be like, you know, have any form of predictability. So I guess what I'm saying is like, I'm excited to see what this looks like in another three years. What is our conversation going to look like then? Yeah. I mean, we've got records to make it till then. So yeah, that's right. (laughs) (laughs) We're all ready for that, dude. Yeah. I mean, um, I'll, I'll, I'll leave it off on this. Another unifying point about all this is like, you've got the consistency, you've got the motivations in the right place. You've got the distribution of things an artist can be. You also have sustainability. You find something you can do. You find something you can do without killing yourself every week. And then you just continue doing it, slightly improving it as you can. And if you just set that forward in motion for a few years, like anything is possible. I'm so glad you said that. I think it's a great point to end off on because when you start, when you, when we started this conversation, you started to talk about the some kid punk work that you're doing. One of the first things that you said, and I don't think we underlined it hard enough is you said, I started making music. We started producing stuff and I immediately felt like, you know, setting up cameras and setting up lights and, you know, putting together the shot list and all of this stuff that you were planning on doing initially to create, you know, front end content for fan acquisition, you pretty quickly realized like that's not sustainable in the mode of creativity that I'm working within. You found something that I want to, yeah, we want to be able to do it every two weeks was, right. the, was the constraint. Yeah. Yeah. And you realize like that can't happen with what's in front of me. So I'm finding something that fits and something that I love and I think that that can't be stated, you know, heavily enough. Yeah. And it's also like, I, I think a, another good point to drive home there is like constraints. What are your constraints? You know, like the like limitations are the are the mother of creativity, I guess. Right. Like and, and certainly in experimentation, in learning systems, constraints and priors are are important target values. Like, OK, I want two weeks. Why? Cause I feel like one week would just be way too hard, but I want to do it consistently in such a way that's impressive. Okay. Two weeks, almost completely arbitrary, but we treat it like it's a physical law of the universe. Yeah. Because yeah. Because constraints are important. Yeah, totally. You have to build that container, you know? Yeah, for sure. It's so good. A, a container for your creativity. I love it. Hell yeah, dude. Well, yeah, we're, you can, Definitely like follow along. Like I am an open book. Uh, not only not only will I not be hiding any of what we're doing from the marketing front, but we're planning to like open license and release all of our stems and project files and, you know, copy left all that stuff so that like people can create with it. So, you know, it'll be evolving. This is like my big case study that like, I you know, I didn't have going into entrepreneur for my own music, which has kind of always been like a, you know, popper son wears no shoes kind of thing. If you're a musician, yeah. you market music. Why? Why don't you market your own music? It's like because I haven't had any. But now <laughs> we have slaps. We have slaps for days. Yeah, <laughs> for sure. I, I'm really excited to. You know, like I said, I'm excited to see this concept evolve. But I'm excited to see it evolve for you. If you guys are interested in checking out you know, a little bit more of the nitty gritty of what Cirque's doing personally. He also did a ground report on this inside of our Indie Pro training area. So if you are a member, you can check it out in there. If you're not, you can check out Indie Pro at our website, indiepreneur.io. Cirque, this was so much fun, man. Thanks for, thanks for jumping on and nerding out with me. Hey, it's my pleasure. I love creative juice. It's so good to have been back on with you, Jack. And guys, um, if you're an Indie Pro member, you know, and you're like, I want to make content. I want to know about video. I don't know where to start. What do I do? And I will say that everything I ever learned about video, I learned on YouTube and you can do the exact same for $0. But since you're an indie pro member already our over the last year, we've had a member come on the team named uh, Michael Kessler. And he is an absolute badass indie musician and videographer. And he's going to be helping me and Ed talk about this exact thing, ancillary content, specifically for releases, but he's gonna be giving you a full breakdown on like videography from cheap to medium budget. And so that'll be coming to the Indie Pro member area at some point later this year. Ooh, I wasn't and expecting so a teaser today, nice. Yeah, well, we're, we're an open book, you know, we try to be more transparent every, every single week um, if we can. And if you go in your Indie Pro member area, you can see trainings and development at the bottom of your training area. So you can see like what stage they're in. Are we scripting? Are we recording lessons, editing? 
and you can follow along with that it's already up there um so i might not be telling you anything new but that does contain a lot of the stuff you would need to kind of try out something like what i'm trying on so hopefully that'll be helpful for you guys <laughs> yeah for sure i'm excited i can't wait well thanks so much for listening indies this was so much fun and we will see you next time on creative juice peace out